Good morning, each one. Good to see you this morning, this beautiful Lord's Day we've been blessed with. We are studying a course right now through the book of Genesis, these last two quarters of the year. And had one question remaining from Lesson 9 that I think is extremely important for us to cover, so I want to do that. So Lesson 9 is where we're going to begin after our prayer this morning. That's question 13, final question. Then we'll move into Lesson 10 uh, that will be focused on Genesis chapters 18 and 19. But back in Genesis 17, if you'll have your Bibles open there is where this question will connect to. So as we mentioned, we've got one question we want to finish up here in Lesson 9. Notice this lesson focused on these three chapters of Genesis 15, 16, and 17. The God's covenant with Abram, the birth of Ishmael we studied in this, this uh, lesson. This is the question we want to focus on, the covenant of circumcision. And so question 13 we asked from lesson 9, for what purpose did God command Abraham and his descendants to be circumcised? Now, I mean, we know about that covenant. We see it a lot referenced even in the New Testament about the Jews and circumcision and even problems that arose between Jews and Gentile Christians over this issue in the first century. But why did God command it to begin with? And uh, how does chapter 17, 23 through 27, demonstrate to us again, once again, Abraham's faith? And then in what way does circumcision still apply to us today? And it does. Okay. And so first part of that, as we look at the text here in Genesis 17, verses 7 through 14, uh, what was the purpose? For what purpose did God command Abraham and his descendants to be circumcised? What do you see in the text? Anyone? Norma? It was a sign of the covenant that, uh, that, the, uh, that, that personal covenant that God had with Abraham and his line of descendants. It, it certainly did separate. This was a part of the separation. Certainly the law of Moses would do that even more specifically and detailed as they would be unlike all the nations around them. But here the separation begins of Abraham and his descendants and the nations around them. Um, and so circumcision is given here as a symbol or as, as Norm A. said, a sign that each male that was born or, or bought into the family was a part or prosel, prosel, became a proselyte to the, you know, the Jewish faith, but brought into the family as part of that nation promised to Abraham. And as part of that nation, they became an heir to the land that would be given to his descendants. Something else you might add to that question. Okay. And how serious was this covenant? Verse 14. They break the covenant and be cut off from the people. That's right. So, as Erica mentioned, verse 14. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So this wasn't like an optional thing. If you feel like it, if you'd rather not do it, don't worry about it. No. It, it, this is a covenant I'm making with you. And if you're not honoring my covenant, you'll be cut off. Uh, now, how did Abraham in this text demonstrate his faith? What do you think? Hey. Yeah, and you think about, you know, how this is misused by some of Jacob's sons later. You remember that story? That's, that's Todd's material, but how the brothers want to get back for what someone had done to their sister and say, okay, hey, we can make a covenant and we can be, but you're going to have to be circumcised. And here are grown men, right? And all of them are being circumcised. And while they're trying to heal up from their uh, surgery wounds, they come in and slaughter them when they're at their weakest there. So, you know, you think about when a, uh, a baby boy among the Jews is eight days old, they're circumcised the foreskin of their flesh. Baby versus grown men. But Abraham doesn't and his men and those with him in his household do not put this off the very same day as Eric has said. As God said to him, Abraham obeyed and every male among the men of Abraham's house were circumcised. 
and the flesh of their four skins. Norma? Another way I think it, it demonstrates Abraham, Abraham's faith is the, is the idea that the, the purpose for having the sign is, is for the covenant. The covenant was for a child that wasn't born yet. Yeah. So his faith, his, he's doing this in advance, having faith in God that the child, his promise will be true, that that child, in fact, will be born. And he's, he's doing it up front. So that it gives us an idea of what faith uh, should look like for us. That's right. You and your descendants, every male child among you shall be circumcised. And he hasn't had his own descendant from him and Sarah yet, right? So that's, that's, that's uh, another great demonstration of his faith and trust, confidence, but obedience to God's will, right? Great point. And then this last part, um, last question of Number 13, what way does circumcision still apply to us today based on what we read in Romans 2 and Colossians 2? So you have the Jewish Christians who are still making, obviously the Jews in general did, but the Jewish Christians would bring this into the Lord's church and make a big deal out of circumcision, physical circumcision. And Paul says what matters here in Romans 2 is what? Circumcision of the heart, so spiritual circumcision, right? And, and what does that mean if, we're, if, if someone's circumcised in the heart? Because this is not just a male thing. This is a male-female thing in the church. To be circumcised in the heart would be what? Yeah, because you think about a physical circumcision, you're, you're cutting off, right? So there's a cutting. If you're circumcised in the heart, you want to have a heart that is, is, is able to be cut, pricked, pierced, right? Kind of like we see in Acts 2. Uh, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They had a heart that became circumcised, and they were then receptive and obedient to God's will. If we're circumcised in the heart, brethren, we're going to have a tender and receptive and humble and obedient heart to God's will. Now, specifically as we think about becoming a Christian, a child of God being saved, there's a spiritual surgery that takes place that Paul speaks of in Colossians 2. And this is a great passage uh, to use with our, our friends, neighbors who uh, sadly have been taught error about baptism and how it's not essential to salvation uh, for a number of reasons. Colossians 2 is a great passage because it talks about our, our sins being removed, but when are they removed? This, this, the surgery table, so to speak, is baptism. That's when, in, in the circumcision of Christ, it talks about the circumcision of Christ. He's the surgeon and he's cutting off. What's he cutting off? The bodies, the, 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 the sins of the body of the flesh uh, there in Colossians 2, 11 and 12. And he's removing those uh, through baptism in the working of God. It's not a work of man. It's the working of God. Yes, our faith, our obedience to do what God says. And, and, and so our sins are cut off by this spiritual circumcision that Christ is performing here. In Colossians 2, 11 and 12. So great, great text to keep in mind on, on that point. But spiritual circumcision. Yes, everybody needs spiritual circumcision. With their sins being cut off and removed in Christ. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. And having a heart that is circumcised. That will be humble and obedient. Re receptive to doing God's will. Norm? And also, uh, it gives us an idea of the, uh, the, the permanence of this uh, circumcision. Is something that can't be undone, can't be uncircumcised. They can't undo that that process. And circumcision of the heart is supposed to be the same way. Uh, and, and so we have a, a, an unchanging symbol. It's it's supposed to go forward. When you change your heart, you're supposed to be changing and not go back to the old the old way. Supposed. But it, that tend, once tender heart can be hardened, right? The Hebrew writer speaks of that, and so exhort one another daily, brethren lest you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So we want to keep that heart, continue to keep it tender uh, and cut with God's word, not where it becomes calloused and hardened and not receptive. All right. Well, get your uh, foot on the gas pedal and push down. Lesson 10, that's what I'm referring to. We've got a lot to cover. and We took up part of our class already with last week. So the Lord visits Abraham, Abraham pleads for Sodom, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then at the end of chapter 19, what we read about Lot and his daughters. So Genesis 18 and 19 is where you need to be in your Bibles, please. 
Awesome. And if you have your Waldron book, In the Beginning God, then you would want to have it maybe open to uh, bottom of page 65, kind of begins chapter 18, but maybe pages 66, 67, if you have that book with you, would be a good place to have it. And again, there's the pages. Um, you'll find the Waldron material, but the two chapters in what we're focused on. So question one, jumping right in, what are some reasons that we should practice hospitality like Abraham? I mean, maybe we could say like Abraham and Lot, right? The Hebrew writer brings this up. Surely, this is what he's referring to in Hebrews 13, verse 2, right? Sure, uh, Shirley? Uh, time next to well, it says you unwillingly entertain some angels. No, no. <coughs> yeah, he says, do not forget to entertain strangers. And it's interesting, he doesn't, he doesn't use specifically the word hospitality, but yet he does use the word hospitality here because literally in the entertaining of strangers is what hospitality means. So do not forget to entertain strangers. He's saying do not forget to practice hospitality. Okay, for by so doing, some, who's the some? Well, I know Abraham and Sarah, and then I know in the next chapter, Lot, and really these two stories are kind of bookended. The Sodom story is bookended by hospitality on the kind of the front end and then on the back end or in the midst of it. Um, but by so doing, some have unwittingly uh, entertained angels. So what am I supposed to take away from that? I practice hospitality and someone might be an angel that comes to my house. Well, maybe this, that we never know what great blessings may come to us by being hospitable. What unexpected blessings may come to us and our families and, and to those that we're extending it to. And certainly as you think back through the years and if you've been engaged in that, it, there are great blessings in, in being involved in and that good work. Um, Norm? Yeah, I'm reminded of the, the idea that we're not supposed to do things so that to be seen by men. And so the, this feeds into this idea that you never, you never know who's watching or who's not watching. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. But your actions should be consistent. And, uh, and this is a great example of it uh, here. No, 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 not try to get something out of it. It's just, uh, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, what is revealed to us about the three men that visited Abraham in this text? And as you see, I put that in parentheses, three, the three men, because the text brings out that these three men are, well, from heaven, and two of them, at least, are, you, st you seem to have, as you read the text, the, well, they don't seem to have, the Lord is here. The Lord is referenced multiple times, and then you have two others with him that we know end up going on to Sodom uh, as divine messengers on behalf of God, uh, angels. And something we know from these, these stories, an interesting study would be the study of angels, and that's something that I did one time in a I think it was in a ladies' Bible class in Texas years ago. We just did a study of angels, and there's a lot. I mean, you may not realize how much is in the Bible about angels until you actually do a study on angels. And uh, there's a lot in the Old Testament. There's quite a bit in the New Testament. But one of the things we, we know about angels, um, these ministering spirits, is that they can come in the form of men, right? They can come in the appearance of, of men, and so we had the Lord and two angels appeared as men. And why are they coming? What's the purpose of them coming? That's right. They came to announce that Sarah was going to have a son in the year to follow, right? All right. Okay, anybody else? Number two, why did Sarah laugh about the angel's statement that she would have a son? And we ask a follow-up to that how was her laughter different, or was it different from Abraham's and that we read about in the previous chapter? And 
then finally, how do we know that Sarah's attitude must have changed regarding God's promise of a son based on what we read there in Hebrews 11 and 11? So, first of all, what does the text bring out to us about why Sarah laughed about the angel's statement she would have a son? Because here's, here's the Lord and the angels, and they're speaking to, to Abraham here. And in verse 9, as they show this hospitality, um, brought some water to wash their feet, rest themselves under the tree. That's verse 4. It quickly, they quickly make preparations to feed them. Notice something else. They, they ate. That's interesting too, right, that they ate. And then in verse 9, they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? He said, Here in the tent. And then he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And then we're told here that Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. She was eavesdropping. That's what we're calling it. Okay, which was fine because this, this, this promise, this uh, revelation was, was for both of them. It involved both of them clearly. Um, and then we read now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah, what? She laughed out loud. Is that what it says? She says she laughed with, within herself. Clarissa? I thought it incredulous. You know, like she, of course, this next verse, or following, you know, she's like, here I am, old and this <coughs> in age, past my childbearing years, and I'm going to have this, so... She's unbelieving, but like laughing in like a, wow, are you serious kind of a way. So, and then of course we'll follow it up with like, that kind of shows her lack of faith, even though they've been told this for a while now. But it's, it's impossible for her to believe being so old and past that stage. All right. Eric? I agree with Clarissa. I, I put that she doubted because when she's called out on it by the Lord, she lies and says, no, I didn't lie. And so that shows that there is some type of shame there. So if she, if you had a, if she laughed out of, like, of joy, you laugh sometimes out of joy, you don't lie about that. And so. Uh, there's a different kind of laughing. <laughs> there are always a different kind of laughing. Because uh, Abraham did it. In the previous chapter, now Sarah does it. Well, as God showing partiality here, it seems to be a different kind of laughter. Um, what's brought out in the text is, well, yeah, her advanced age. Think about how old she was, and she was older when this promise was first made. If Abraham was seventy-five, then she would have been sixty-five, and now she is eighty-nine because it's going to be in the next year when she has Isaac. She'll be ninety, so eighty-nine. That's a big difference, 65 to 89 would be a big difference now. It certainly was even then. But as she thinks about her age, I've, I've always been barren. I'm, 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 not, I'm not an age where you can even physically do that, okay? So, you know, are you kidding me? Uh, maybe her, her thoughts as she, as she uh, laughs about that, but her laughter was the expression it seems of doubt at this time, disbelief, and not delighted, delighted astonishment at what God was about to bring to pass. Now, something must have shifted when we get to Hebrews 11, 11, right? Because it doesn't skip over Sarah in the list of heroes of faith and of those that we can look to as an examples that, of men and women that possessed a faith that Please God, and you, you need to have a faith like Noah, like uh, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah. Because in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 11, what does the Hebrew writer tell us there about her? We have that familiar beginning of the verse, by faith, Sarah. And what does he go on to say? beyond the proper time of life since she had considered him faithful who had promised. 
All, All right. right. So, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Okay. So she's called out, as Erica pointed out. She was called out about her laughter. She denies it. Abraham's not buying into that. He's got it on uh, a good account from divine messengers. No, you did laugh. Uh, you surely did. But something, something shifted, thankfully, in her, her uh, attitude about what God had said um, and her faith and trust him. And, and he who promised was, was faithful to do it. Okay. Uh, Todd? Yeah, I, don't know that, I, I don't see any partiality or even a need to uh, infer different types of laughter. From Abraham in chapter 17, you see a lack of faith where even in the next verse in 17, verse 18, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So his faith is not very strong that God's going to be able to deliver this either. We just need to remember that as we read through the book of Genesis, we're going to see numerous times where people do things and God doesn't specifically say, and that was wrong. Like Jacob taking two wives and then concubines and whatnot. So here, yeah, Sarah gets called out because of the, the, the conversation flow. But in the conversation with Abraham, Abraham suggests Ishmael. And so God's answer is no. And he reemphasizes that it's going to be Sarah. But I don't think his faith was stronger than Sarah's. They both laughed. <clears throat> Okay. Um, one of the things we pointed out about Abraham, maybe even last week, was kind of connecting back to Bruce's Reeves Monday night sermon, the journey of Abraham's faith. Um, that the faith that did not waver, he didn't get there overnight. I mean, we, 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 see, we see it from the beginning, uh, not even knowing where he was going, he was called out of Ur of Chaldees. But we also see, just like it should be in any of us, a faith that is maturing, a faith that is growing, and it's trust and it's confidence, kind of a, maybe a climax when we get to Genesis 22 with telling him to, now, now that you have a son, finally, go offer him to me as a burnt offering, um, and, his, and his faith there. But yeah, we, we've, we've pointed out with Abraham weaknesses uh, in his, his faith at times, right? And, and so it's not like his was always solid, no question or no questioning, <laughs> and, and Sarah's wasn't. That's not, not the case. So uh, to be fair, that certainly needs to be um, pointed out again, I think. Appreciate that. Norm? I'd like to admit to, uh, to Thomas and his faith in, in uh, dealing with the idea of Jesus being resurrected. So people go through different, like you were saying, the journey of faith. And people go through... Uh, have different ways that they have to get there mm -hmm. to that to that end. Ultimately, uh, the goal is the same, but uh, because of our differences and everything, some we, sometimes we take we need to see something a little different for us to get to that place. And uh, I think that's a situation we have here with uh, Sarah and, and uh, Abraham, the two different people. Uh, same goal they're looking for, but they're getting there in a little bit different way. It takes a little bit more for Sarah in some of these cases to be able to get it. <laughs> All right. So question three, real quick. What attributes of God are revealed to us in these verses? That What stands out to you? Attributes of God. Anything too hard for Gerald? Okay. One of the things is he's all powerful, right? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Um, and so that's said in verse 14 after the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I'll return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Um, obviously, nothing's too hard for the Lord. With God, all things are possible uh, and not impossible because He's God, because He's all-powerful, all omnipotent. Uh, not only that, prior to that, with the Lord and the angels coming, 
what they are stating specifically and revealing shows God's foreknowledge or he's all-knowing, right? Um, and so that God is all-knowing that Sarah would have a son and what time that would happen at the appointed time, which would be a year from this point in time. And so he also knew what else? How did Sarah laugh? Out loud? It says within herself. Kind of like we see with Jesus during his earthly ministry, the inner thoughts, and he would reveal those inner thoughts oftentimes of his enemies and others. But uh, we see that here with the Lord, of course, because he's the Lord. Uh, number four, how did the Lord, rep uh, how did the Lord pay tribute to the faith of Abraham and the relationship that existed between the two of them? So here in chapter 18, first of all, verses 16 through 33, um, so they've come to Abraham and Sarah, their household, uh, re-emphasize God's promise, but the appointed time it would be in a year, and then what happens? Why, why have, what's another specific reason they have come down at this time? Because of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Because of these two very, very wicked cities. And so here the Lord is in, in this conversation, kind of neat. What, is it, what does he say? I have this from Abraham, what I'm about to do. Yeah. As the, so as the Lord and the two angels looked toward Sodom and the impending judgment upon that wicked city, he asked whether he should hide, uh, conceal, or reveal to Abraham what he was doing. Especially in light of what? What's brought out in the text? And especially in light of the great nation that he's going to become. And how all nations of the earth are going to be blessed in him. That's brought up in connection with whether I should be sharing these things with him. And then notice in also the, uh, the reasons that God formed this special relationship with him. What's stated in verse 19 of, of Genesis 18. For I have known him. Why? Well, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that, he, that they uh, keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So God doesn't hide it, obviously. He makes it known what he plans to do and why he's going to do it. And what, how else do we see... Um, this relationship and how close it is and how well thought of Abraham is in the eyes of God and, and really still the Lord paying tribute to, to this man and his faith. Uh, what happens as they discuss this? Yeah, yeah, so Abraham begins to uh, intercede on behalf uh, specifically of Sodom. He's got some family there, right? Um, but he begins at, at 50. And what does he bring up? He brings up the attributes of God. And surely you wouldn't destroy the place uh, with the righteous in it. Um, far be it from you to do such a thing, verse 25, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And God says, well, if there's 50, I'll spare it. And Abraham keeps bringing the number down from there, <laughs> keeps, keeps, keeps bringing it up to God until he gets to what? Gets to 10. And even at 10, God says, all right, if there's 10, I'll, I'll spare the city. And of course, as we know, there wasn't even 10. But again, that speaks, I think, to that even respect that God had, admiration that he had for his servant Abraham to allow that conversation to even take place, to hear him about this, uh, to be willing to, okay, yep, if there's 10, obviously God knew who would be righteous and not righteous. And you think about what is said about Abraham here in James, James 2.23, how he's called what? 
the friend of God. And isn't, doesn't this text kind of bring that out? The friendship. Okay, not that they're on an equal level. They're not at all. There's God and man, but still, how God esteemed, or it's kind of a tribute here, I think, this text in many different ways to Abraham. But Abraham was called the friend of God. You see that, I think, here. Uh, Todd? I, I like the question, shall I hide this from Abraham? It shows God's choice in revealing or concealing his knowledge from mankind. And who knows how many times he's uh, pondered that question, what he's going to reveal. You see Job, who never really gets an explanation from God. Right. He's just expected to be faithful to God. We all know a lot more about Job's situation than he ever knew. And so we're in a similar situation and we shouldn't question God on what he reveals to us and doesn't. Mm -hmm. Norm? Norm? Uh, we, we get uh, multiple examples here of how God uh, tests us, tests our faith in, uh, in, in because all of these questions that are coming out from, a from Abraham are Abraham's thoughts and opinions and, uh, and ideas and, and God's working it through uh, you know all this I just find it interesting in the different ways that God reveals how he tests mm -hmm. us and if we can take some of these examples uh, maybe we can learn something Appreciate it. All right. So number five, what divine attribute of God should this story bring to our minds? Hint, 2 Peter 39. <laughs> God is also love. Long suffering of God. He's long suffering. So in that context of 2 Peter 3, it's talking about the final judgment, the come, second coming of Christ. And Peter states why he hasn't come yet. It's because of his divine long suffering. Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God allows, you think about what was said back in chapter 15 when God made a covenant with the animals and uh, the torch and uh, what we read about there and what he revealed to him about his descendants going into a, uh, to be strangers in a land that's not theirs, serve them, flick them for 400 years, obviously, in Egypt. Uh, but later, verse 16, he says in Genesis 15, but in the fourth generation, they, they shall return. Therefore, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Well, it doesn't state it there, but that's, that's God's long suffering. You think about Nineveh, Jonah sent, 40 days and you're going to be overthrown, you're going to be destroyed. Well, they were spared at that time because they humbled themselves and they repented. But there's God's long suffering. Jonah, uh, a Jewish prophet sent to a Gentile people who had become so wicked, God's done with them if they don't, if they don't change immediately. And they did. They repented. Later they would be judged because they would go back to their wickedness. But again, this, this story really as wicked as as these inhabitants were of Sodom and Gomorrah and the plains of Jordan, uh, we are reminded, yeah, here's God's wrath and judgment. It's fierce. But what leads, uh, what precipitated this, or, or excuse me, what led up to this, though, is, is all hit that long suffering. And even if there's ten, ten good people, ten righteous people, I'll, I'll spare everybody else. And obviously there, there wasn't. Um, number six, how are the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah described to us in Scripture? What effects does this have upon Lot and his family? And then what strong reminder or reminders should this tragic story provide to godly families today? So, first part, going all the way back to chapter 13, when you remember there was the big strife and squabble between the herdsmen of Abraham and Lot, or Abram at that time and Lot, and Abraham said, choose what you would like to, nephew, and he did, and what are we immediately told about where he was heading? Chapter 13, verse 13, it says what? Well, they're exceedingly, the people of Sodom, they're exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And we read in, in these passages, 13, 13, 18, 20, 19, 13, and then getting into the New Testament passages, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, their sin is very grave. That's chapter 18, verse 20. Uh, we read about the filthy conduct of the wicked. Uh, 
the Peter passage, uh, he, he, the filthy conduct of the wicked, seeing and hearing their lawless deeds daily, seeing and seeing, and he's hearing about it, uh, he, and, he and his family. Um, and in the Jude passage, Jude verse 7, it speaks of how they've given themselves over to sexual immorality. They've gone after strange flesh, which speaks, of course, of the homosexuality there. Um, so, extremely wicked, perverse, corrupt. And what effects did this have upon Lot and his family? Okay, Norm, keep it brief. We've got five minutes. Well, it, it was enticing because each time we learn about Lot, he's a little closer and a little closer and a little closer. So sin is, sin is enticing. Whatever, whatever was there is enticing. Uh, so that shows us the power that that, that tra attraction that it has. We hear the expression, the grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence. I mean, that's why he chose it, right? It was green, as well watered. It looked great, perfect for what I want. Okay, the land maybe was great, but the people weren't who lived in it. And he kept getting closer till we find him sitting right at the gate of Sodom, which we've talked about briefly, probably a position of some kind of authority or, or leader there. Uh, not that he was well respected by many of them there and loved and appreciated because he still had righteousness. I mean, it says this godly man, that's how Peter refers to him. But, you know, just as he had a choice to go that way, didn't he have a choice not to stay? I mean, if we, if we get in a situation where, okay, I thought this was a good decision, but in hindsight, this was a bad decision, right? Because we're not, we're not perfect in our judgments and decisions in life, and we choose a path, we pray about it, but maybe we end up making a bad decision about where we go with our family and say, well, this is not a good, good place for us to be. And they could have pulled up stakes and God would have continued to bless him, no doubt, as he had before, but he chose to stay. And you think over time, what that did to the him, what it did to his wife, what it did to his children. Erica, I thought you had your hand up. Was it Clarissa? Oh, sorry, Clarissa. That was just leading towards that, where the effects it had on his family, which of course we'll see later, um, but he was even going to marry off his, his daughters into the men of the city. Um, I don't know what he thought that was going to lead to for them and for their families that followed, or you know, for their, the family that they would grow that would follow. It wouldn't be good. It, there would be no way, because obviously these men didn't even trust him to leave. You know, they were wicked enough to want to stay and didn't, didn't believe it. Um, and then... I know we're getting into it, but I mean, like, there's a yes, longing, I mean, there's a longing there where, you know, his wife looks back, you know, she, um, they're losing their possessions and um, all the ties that they had grown in this city, um, so, you know, she has enough of a longing or a dread of what's happening to look back, even though she was clearly told not to, and then the daughter's logic um, and reasoning for what they should do now, even immediately, um, doesn't lead to anything good. So it's just, you can see the effects on the family very clearly throughout the rest of the story. I got more into scripture. Old Testament, New Testament about who we associate with. If we go with who we allow our family to associate with and be around to influence us. Proverbs 12, 26 talks about let the righteous choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked will lead them astray. Let the righteous choose their companions, their friends carefully. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, of course, don't, do not be deceived, evil companionship corrupts good morals. They had good morals going in. This was righteous people. He, it's almost surprising to me that Peter still describes him as godly, but he does in, in 2 Peter chapter 2. And yet, over time, the, the the effects of that, the consequences of that, their good morals were corrupted. Uh, he had daughters that evidently married men of Sodom. Is that who you want your children marrying, people there? Uh, no. Um, he, Lot offered his two virgin daughters to these perverse and violent men. I mean, what father in the right mind is going to do that? And then you have later the daughters who escape with him. They get him drunk. 
sleep with their father because uh, they're convinced there's no other man on the earth. And maybe everyone's been destroyed. I don't know. But there's incest. And then he loses his wife, as Clarissa mentioned, as they depart, as they flee uh, the destruction of, of the cities. Um, so it, it, matters. it matters where we live. It matters who we allow to influence ourselves and our families. And we need to sur surround ourselves with godly people as much as possible. All right, Norm P., you got probably less than 60 seconds. Go ahead. Well, I think we also forget the whole reason Lot ended up there is because he had great wealth and a great many servants. And when we see him at this juncture, it is Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. <laughs> Abraham had hundreds of servants, and he had a similar number. And when we see him here, there are four. Only four. He lost all of that in the meantime between those two. And I think we oftentimes forget about that part. That's the whole reason they left. They were so great and so powerful, and so many of their servants. And when we see him here, it is him, his wife, and his two daughters. Thank you. All right. Well, now I'm really in trouble. I got a lot of questions left on this one. And uh, then chapter 11. Pick up lesson 11. Should be in the a sleeve back there for next week, and we're going to do our best to fly through the rest of this lesson.